Hello everyone and welcome to our video series for The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical here at Playhouse Square in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Bryce Kessler, part of the education team, and I'm here with our director, Chris McCarroll, um, who's going to answer some of our behind-the-scenes questions today. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hello. Um, so our f just to get us in, we are currently interviewing you at Baldwin Wallace University on campus. Yep. You are a graduate. How's it feel to be back? It's like I never left, honestly. Uh, I feel like these walls hold so much history in my own life, and my brother was also a music theater major here, so I remember being a kid oh, cool. and coming to see his presentations like in the room next door. So this place really is the heart of where I fell in love with theater and also studied it. and coming back to venture in a new direction just feels like the warmest, coziest way to enter into this unknown territory. Yeah, that's so great. And so right after um, BW, you sort of jumped into the Percy Jackson scene. How, tell us about um, your journey with The Lightning Thief. The Lightning Thief was the oddest timeline for a show in New York. I mean, Usually shows that have beginnings like ours in New York. It's just a small off-Broadway show and it just kind of ends there. Uh, so when I remember when I auditioned, I was like, he's the son of Poseidon. It's downtown. It's a really weird, fun show. Okay, like I, I'll take a swing at this. And it was just one of those experiences where as soon as I walked in and I met that creative team and I sang the songs and read from the show, it was just one of those rare moments where it was so compatible with my DNA that it was just so easy, so simple. <laughs> uh, so it felt like a match made in heaven. It felt like fate in a weird way. Uh, and it just happened so quick. By the time I came home, I knew I had the role, and we rehearsed for the Off-Broadway show, and it was so bold in its scrappiness, and the creative team gave the cast so much ownership of the characters, so it really felt like myself up there. Uh, and we opened, and it just never stopped blowing up to all of our surprises. We didn't rehearse this thinking it was going to be huge. Um, we didn't end the broad, off-Broadway run thinking that there was a tour and a Broadway run in the mix. So it was just a very rare process of a show that was created in a really small environment thinking it was gonna stay in a small environment and it just kept gaining more and more steam. Now that you've acted in it you know, mm -hmm. for so many years, now you're joining that creative team that you love so much um, as your directing debut. So what inspired you to get into directing after acting? I always knew directing would be where my entire brain could be used. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of hobbies outside of performing that in director's world, I can really utilize each thing. Uh, my dad's a woodshop teacher, so I've always been building and creating and interior design. So I feel like there's like a set design part of my brain. Um, and I got into photography, so I really dived into lighting and how to create moods and emotional effects through lighting and color. So I feel like I have a lighting designer part of my brain. Uh, and there's almost a choreographical aspect of staging a show. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the performance aspect, really getting the emotional lives of the characters, what we're actually trying to tell with this show, and how to cohesively make all those parts of my brain work together uh, to tell a story. I always knew if I could be in that seat, I feel like my entire brain could be firing. Because in performing, I always felt like I was using the parts of my brain I wanted to be using, but it wasn't my full brain. So I'm excited to really be in a seat where I feel like I'm using all my skills that I've developed in my life. Coming from that inside, on the stage perspective, 
now that you're in the director's chair, what are some of those like personal choices that you hope to put out there on the stage? I think the biggest the biggest changes always start with like what's your starting point. So I always call it the North Star. And the North Star of the Broadway production was really doing the books justice, creating a world where the people who adored these books could come in and feel like the people on stage respected and recreated a world that they lived privately in their rooms as a kid and they could see it on stage and it was everything they hoped it would be. And I feel like that was mission accomplished. So coming into this production, I felt like the world was our oyster. Uh, and so I was like, what is the North Star of this production? And I really wanted it to be what kids this story was created for. And it's the disenfranchised, uh, the young adults that were never told that they had any gifts, that struggled in school, that teachers discarded as if they had no potential, come from broken homes. So I really dirtied up this production so kids coming into the theater can really see themselves in the show when they might not necessarily see themselves in most music theater productions. So I'm really trying to grit this up uh, and really try to rip these characters out of detentions, mm -hmm. out of juvie even uh, in the modern world and really make it realistic and sit in that, that world more so than uh, trying to create a fantasy world that is super religiously respectful of the source material because mm. I feel like we already did that so that felt like it had a lot of potential and if we really nailed that then the script the score would shine and I think the original intent of the story would shine through in a way um, that maybe didn't shine through in the Broadway production mm -hmm. I know I was a huge fan of the books growing yeah. up. They were so integral. Yeah. And I loved getting into that world so much. And now that, you know, I've grown up so much in here and now I'm in college. Yeah. Um, so certainly the show can evolve too as, yeah. as people evolve exactly. and grow up. Yep. What do you think you want your audience's biggest takeaway to be? I want the adults in the audience to walk away being like, I know those kids and maybe I need to give them a second chance. Mm. Maybe I underestimate youth's potential if they're not shining in the way that we tell them they need to shine in our school systems. Uh, and I want kids to feel the energy of a room rooting for kids that they feel like they can really connect to. And maybe when they leave the theater, they feel like the world could root for them at a time when we really need them. And we really rely more and more on the younger generations to come through with new and inventive and empathetic ways to navigate the problems that we face. So to close out this interview, um, I'm gonna ask, what's your favorite part of the show? My favorite part of The Lightning Thief is all the uh, tightrope walking stylistically that we do. Uh, it never takes itself too seriously. It always uses a hint of irony or humor that is so Rick Riordan. Uh, so the show never falls into this super serious tone, even though what we're discussing and what we're trying to create has a serious base to it. Uh, it's always funny and heartfelt and heartwarming in its tone. And it's a really tricky balance between those two, how we can keep it comedic and ironic and funny and casual, but also we're on the verge of the world self-imploding at all times. And we're fighting the entire show to get Percy's mother back. Like, these aren't um, light affairs, but it's almost a coping mechanism of Percy and of the production to always keep one foot out. Otherwise, we would be so overwhelmed that we could never take another step forward. So really walking that line between comedy, humor, irony, and also real life stakes 
is such a fun balancing act as a performer in the show, but more so as a director. Chris, thanks so much for talking to me today. Chris, thank you. Yeah. All right, bye.